Hello everyone and welcome to today's special event. Well, we're up to the second year running with the State of Webinar Marketing Report. So it's very exciting. We've just launched the report and today we're going to delve into all the things that we've actually learned over the past 12 months. I'm joined by Tim Johnston from On24 today. How are you? Very well. Well, hasn't this been an exciting 12 months? Uh, I, I tell you, it's going to be the year of the webinar this year. <laughs> it has, and it's flown by. And I think when, once we initially launched this report into how marketers plan, deliver and execute their events, 12 months ago, we, we weren't really prepared for what was going to happen 12 months down the track, were we? No, no. I think the businesses that have been thinking about a uh, digital first approach yeah. to marketing are the ones that uh, have had to pivot less yes. than uh, our, our others uh, in, the, in the space. Yes. Let's see how many times we can work the word pivot into today's event. So uh, my name is Sarah from Redback, as you know. Um, so let's really get into the nuts and bolts of this webinar and what the, um, what the research was about with the State of Webinar Marketing 2020. We're also going to draw on some of the conclusions from 2019 as well. So Tim, as you know, the last three months have been crazy for webinars. I think most people are becoming web nerds now. Um, but what we really discovered in this is that there has been a big shift. Uh, when we launched this report uh, back in February, yep. was it? COVID-19 was just sort of starting. Like, yeah. it wasn't really prevalent in what we're doing. So I think we sort of caught the back end of it, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. definitely a combination of that sort of early stage sort of panic mode yeah. uh, to this, am I going to be running physical events this year or not? Yeah, um, exactly. And then, yeah, so so good combination of yeah. both. So I think this is a perfect time for you all to actually sit down, relax and enjoy some of the research so you can actually run better webinars in the future. So first of all, it was Australia and New Zealand based and we actually surveyed 100 128 organisations. So this was a mix of in-depth qualitative research and also quantitative, so we could uncover as much information as possible about people running their webinars. I think the biggest thing that we discovered from this is that webinars are clearly becoming a growth medium. People are seeing them work and they're actually becoming a lot more successful for organisations that are running them properly. So the first section of the research we're going to go into is exactly that. So let's talk about webinars as a growth medium. So first of all, I think it's very evident that webinars are working. Mm. And I think that's a great um, testament to everyone out there who's actually launched into webinar series. I think people are starting to tie them together with their marketing plans. And as you can see here, 84% of people actually consider webinars to be a key part of their marketing efforts. And that's up from 70% um, in 2019. So quite a big jump there, isn't it, Tim? Yeah, and, and no doubt, if, if we launched this during March, we would have probably yes. seen that number 100% because yes. it's the, the only channel that we have as marketers to play in this state of play, right? Yeah, exactly. And so people are pivoting, so there's my first time saying that, um, but they're also planning to spend more on their webinar programs as well. And I think the fact that marketers are actually starting to invest in this, we've got a 34% increase since 2019, really shows that organisations are starting to take them seriously as a lead generation channel as well. So congrats to, out there to everyone because we all have a role to play in this. And I think the biggest thing that we all want to hear, um, just so we can keep doing what we're doing, is the fact that webinars are very effective when it comes to them as part of your marketing program. 35% of people, highly effective, and th another 35, mostly effective. So that's also a bit of a switch from last year. In 2019, you'll see on the green graph here, where the majority of people called them sometimes effective and not very effective at all. So it feels like we've made a shift since 2019. And to your point, Tim, I think next year when we do this, we're going to make even a bigger shift. So I think it's great that you've all invested your time to learn a lot more about this because I think they are the future of marketing teams. So with such a huge majority of people, um, the majority of people spending 20% roughly on their budgets when it comes to webinars, how can you make them work for you? So today is about going into the research, but it's also about giving you some tips and some tactical advice to make sure that you can walk away from this session and implement it straight away. So the first thing as marketers, what we need to be doing is stop thinking about webinars as a silo program. They need to complement your entire marketing strategy and you need to create consistency and you need to really think about at which stage they're going to play in the funnel. And we'll talk about the funnel content later because mm. we also got some great research from that. So first thing I would say is really think about the content that you're producing when it comes to webinars and how that complements not only with your outcomes and what you want to achieve, but your other webinar content. And I'll just give an overview of what we mean about that. So if you have one webinar, it does take a long time to get a webinar up to speed. 
which we'll also go through. Think about the other content that you're producing and how that can tie into that. So do you have blogs? Do you have white papers? Do you have eBooks? And can you adapt that to the online environment and then actually link back for people to download those books? So similar to what we're doing today, we have a report for you guys to download, but we're also discussing the report online. So that then creates webinars. Um, The other part is really making sure that you've got a calendar of your marketing activities and you're slotting your webinars into those marketing activities. We can't really just create a whole six or 12 month content calendar and then, you know, three weeks before say, great, let's do a webinar on this. They really need to be well thought out and then needs to be consistent. Don't you think, Tim? Integration is key there. Yeah, absolutely. And then also look at the top funnel content as well that you're producing. So the content doesn't always have to be specific to your organisation, to your customers or to your prospects, we can actually be a little bit more creative and we'll go into that in a moment. Um, But traction is important, consistency is key. Consider branding your webinar series and consider tying it into your overall marketing plan and getting all your key stakeholders involved. So it's clear that marketers are using webinars and they are becoming a growth medium, which is very, very exciting. But Tim, can you go into the research a little bit and talk about who actually completed the research, um, the frequency of how we're running webinars, yeah. provide some insight? Absolutely. Uh, so so first of all, we, we did have a, a really nice cross-section of industries uh, and ranging from uh, SMB right up through to enterprise. So uh, there's uh, in, in the report, you'll just see how, uh, how broad we, we were in terms of our collection of, of data there, but let, let's dive into uh, you know uh, webinars, how, how we're using them. Number one, and it, it's very clear, and I don't think this is new news, but they're quite a very diverse medium, and they can they can play multiple roles within an organisation across the marketing team. But the prevailing sort of responses here came through from uh, an education perspective and thought leadership. Um, so, you know, really hugging that sort of top end of the funnel, you know, putting your experts on show, getting your experts to help educate uh, the, the market there. So that was nice to see. No, no new news there. But uh, what was really nice to see in this year's report was that there is certainly an increase in the number of webinars that we're running as, as, as marketers, right? So if you if you look here, the the, the blue column of this pie chart uh, is is you know one to five, and, and this is typically what we're sort of advising against this mm. one and done show, yep. uh, maybe there to uh, fill a uh, be a stopgap for a uh, a physical event. Um, you know, in this in this age, I think many marketers will be tempted to run a lot of these sort of style events where yeah. you just plug in holes or, or putting a band aid on yep. uh, your marketing plan. Uh, but really comforting to see that the the majority of of the audience that responded to this survey was that. Uh, essentially, we're, we're running between one and four a month, mm. right? And that just shows the diversity. They may not all be lead generation uh, focused campaigns, yep. but they could be training, they could mm. be product updates, they could be, you know, post purchase uh, best practice for you for your customers, right? Mm. So this this idea of running between one to four gives me a sense that people are adopting this, uh, you know, this content. Think about their webinar programs as as a longer term initiative, which is which is awesome to see. Uh, the the fifty one to one hundred category, uh, the fourteen percent there is is uh, a little bit scary. These they are probably must be exhausted. <laughs> well, they're probably the the Microsofts of the world. These yeah. big organisations that literally have uh, you know webinar resources at the fingertips. Yeah. They have teams of you know ten twenty people just to yeah. get these programs on the ground to run at that velocity. But uh, you know, I would say that uh, you know this month alone, I think on twenty four just locally, yeah, are running thirty one. So, you, you'd be so we're up there. <laughs> we're up there, and that's a that's a team of two. Yeah. Uh, so, so diving into some tips here around, you know, this idea of thinking longer term about your webinar programs. The first tip I'll share is really building out an identity behind your your series. So, uh, whether that's a best, best practice series, we've been running uh, our best practice series for the last eight years, mm-hmm. and there's certainly an identity around it. Our host is uh, almost a celebrity mm-hmm. in, in some ways, uh, but it's this idea of really building a community behind your content and your brand. Uh, that that is resonating well. They should have some connective tissue between them. There's some continuity between your episodes. I I like to call webinars episodes now Mm. because they are really like a television show, right? 
Uh, so that, that connectivity between the episodes is really important here and uh, you don't want to keep drawing your audience back to a registration page over and over again. You've mm-hmm. got to find ways to seamlessly transition people and make it easy for them to access the content. Yeah. So, so one way a lot of our, our clients and customers uh, will, will, will do this is literally by linking the webinars from one to another and providing yeah. this idea of a, a centralised location like, yeah. a, like a Netflix hubs yep. for, the, yep. for the brand where people can binge on their content and that's working really well. Mm. Another tactical tip here which is uh, one of one of my favourites. I love seeing these intro videos where yeah. uh, marketers. We, we love our shiny intros and uh, uh, overproduced uh, uh, videos. But uh, more and more, we're seeing uh, this idea of just starting the experience off on the right foot. And yeah. it's a great way to add, right? I think it's. So we used to think of it as branding and it was a great way for marketers to put their brand front and centre. But I think over the past few months, what we've seen is a lot of our customers in a time of uncertainty and crisis and isolation, getting their CEOs in front of the camera and doing that intro video and not making it about how to use the features and how to ask questions, but hi everyone, we know you're struggling. We're putting on this content for you mm. and you're connecting the whole organisation, mm. all your prospects to that organisation then. And I think there's almost like this, oh, thank God there's a human behind there talking to me moment. And it's yes. just a, it's a bigger way for you to engage people. But it's about that consistency, like you said, at the beginning of every single webinar or episode that you're producing mm. to have that person front and centre as a familiar face. I love that. It's a really nice personal touch yeah. and, and yeah. something that can't be replicated by your competitors as well. You come yeah. across human, authentic, yep. right? Yep. Uh, so that's, that's always a nice touch. So when so when we we also dived into uh, you know who who are we targeting mm. as marketers and and why we're we doing this yeah. uh, so the results are interesting and of course behind each section here there's so much data right I so we've, we've, we we try to day. prioritize and, and consolidate this yeah. right into into bite sized pieces yeah. so again we do encourage you to download the report and get the detail but yeah. uh, the the stats that we saw here was uh, essentially okay as marketers what what are we doing with webinars uh, are we are we marketing abroad mm-hmm. are we marketing locally. And it was nice to see that, you know, uh, 58% are, are using the power of webinars to reach beyond the borders. You know, this yep. was a, a very focused survey in the Australian New Zealand market. Mm. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of them came back saying that, yes, we're using it to tap into international markets, which is great. And then, you know, still seeing a, a high percentage of 42% being locally based audiences. So mm. uh, this doesn't really surprise me because I, I cover the Asia Pacific region and you think about the sheer man lass of, mm. of Australia and just, you know, traveling to do these, you know, three, four city roadshows at a time. Yep. It takes effort and time, right? And it's hard work. So you can see marketers are starting to realize the value of just uh, really scaling their, yep. their event materials, right? Uh, and then, and then, in terms of who are we engaging? So, uh, you know, this was this was also interesting because I've always perceived webinars to be that sort of you know net new prospects mm. and and bringing in new audiences to to educate. Uh, the the number one response was actually customers. Yeah. Okay. Um, so probably not that surprising, but uh, I, I did think that prospects would come out on top there. So. Uh, a lot of a lot of marketers designing programs mm. to educate, share best practices, and inform. But when you combine that with the the next chart on the on the right hand side here of of the objective of the webinar program, mm. the number one reason we run webinars is for lead generation. Do you think there's this sort of cross selling approach as well? So mm. this whole account based marketing thing, everyone's sort of looking on. Okay, we've got huge customer base here, mm-hmm. how do we get in, how do we promote other products and services to them, how do we create these raving fans that everyone's yeah. been talking about for years and yeah. maybe people are using webinars for this type of... I think it's a really good point, yeah. focus on the 20% that yeah. bring in the 80%, yeah. right? Yeah. So this idea of, uh, you know, working with your customers to engage them more, find those opportunities to to, to delight and engage mm-hmm. them yeah. um, and offer uh, ways to grow those accounts. Mm. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I think, you know, the, the lead generation aspect still, still rings true here and mm-hmm. and uh, just engaging engaging your customers more for retention, uh, customer satisfaction yeah. is is also a, a strong reason a here. The interesting thing that I'll, I'll watch for for next year is that that two percent at, at the top of that chart is uh, you know this ability to save on the yeah. physical event cost. Right now, I think. Marketers don't realise this now, but throughout the year, throughout 2020, we'll yeah. realise just how effective and efficient from a cost perspective yeah. that, that webinars can be. Yeah. So I, I I put my money on that one being the, the biggest right, move next year. You heard it here first, team. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so looking at some tips in terms of how to reach these audiences, and I mentioned it before, but 
you know, and, and I've, I come across this challenge a lot myself as well, but these blended audiences, whether you're, you know, targeting international audiences or local, the, the number one consideration here is, is really, you know, just be, be attentive to that time zone and, mm. and when you want to uh, run that for your ideal core audience, right? So if I was to run an Asia-Pacific um, based webinar, uh, and I want to attract multiple geos, mm. uh, I have to consider the different time zones. So, you know, from New Zealand all the way to mm. India uh, yeah. spans many, many hours, and we're not gonna we're not gonna satisfy all. So, the way I approach that is to identify the core audience groups, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd use functionality like Simulated Live mm. to run at a more convenient time for for the audience. And of course, to your point earlier, uh, on demand is is key here when mm. you're spanning multiple time zones. Yep. Um, making your content available on demand is is a no brainer, and it's almost a hygiene factor these days. Mm. People want the content when they when they can access it and yep. when they've got time. So without doing that, you're leaving a lot on the table, right? Yeah. Um, another another uh, aspect here to focus on is uh, you know when when you're looking for webinar programs, we did mention a lot of the top of the funnel sort of initiatives mm -hmm. and and the role that webinars can play right through the funnel. Um, but you know we always advise clients to start looking at some of those um, you know mundane and repetitive business processes mm. that do exist in most businesses and find ways to drive efficiencies to to eradicate those and and help your uh, your human resources be more effective with their time. Yeah. So so a great example I saw recently and. Uh, LinkedIn spoke at one of mm -hmm. our uh, conferences last year and they shared their success around their onboarding program. Yeah. They use webinars to onboard customers. Uh, they found that they identified that their customer success managers were spending an awful lot of time just doing mm. the same thing over and over again and training and uh, it's very repetitive content. They identified an opportunity to uh, produce a, a, a glossy, a high production value um, mm. event that they run repetitively every day now mm. so as they onboard new customers. That's the first touch. And that saved them a lot of time, yep. energy and uh, resources to do that. Now those resources can spend more uh, time developing strategic initiatives with the customer and, and providing more value. Yeah. So then, so then the the last section here, uh, section four, is is really around uh, you know how effective are they as as lead generation tools and and you know was it was the perspective around the cost of of running a webinar program. Uh, a, a you know overwhelming majority here at eighty percent agreed that uh, webinars do help lower the cost of, of, of lead generation, which is which is fantastic. Uh, it's it's a very scalable uh, and engagement driven mechanism that allows us to reach uh, very far and wide, as we mm. just saw. We looked at uh, the you know where where marketers are running these webinar programs as well in terms of the stage of the funnel. And uh, I was I was very pleased to see that so many of us, 55%, uh, are actually running webinars or designing these programs to, you know, nurture people right through that funnel and, mm. and beyond as well. It's not just about that sales cycle, but you know, as you just heard in the LinkedIn example, how do you identify those mm. customer-facing initiatives as well and and speed up some business processes? So, uh, really good to see. I I put my money on the the top of the funnel in this in this case, thinking that most would be thinking about you know their thought leadership programs and uh, these uh, programs that have a really wide net on them, right? Um, but uh, very comforting to see uh, strong I think it's an entry point as well for a lot of marketers, this top of funnel content. And definitely over the past three months, we've seen um, a lot of our customers have had a huge increase in their attendance and their registrations at webinars mm. because it is that top of funnel content. So back in January, people um, were talking to their members around the bushfires, for example, right. and then COVID-19 and then managing through crisis. Yes. So those sorts of topics have become huge because yes. people are craving content yes. right now. And I think you're right, we have to be careful that we don't just focus too high on the top of the funnel because then people just get stuck. Yes. It's like they're just, there's a little cyclone just churning. So we really need to, I think some great advice for marketers this year is to focus on nurturing people through that, not just with webinars, but through all your content. 100%. So, so when we talk about uh, you know lead generation and, yeah. and pipeline generation and uh, to the point of pipeline acceleration, uh, how do we do this in a way that is actually, to your point, mm. moving people through? And uh, not only thinking about the, the different uh, webinar programs that you can design, whether that's a demo program at the bottom of the funnel or maybe it's a customer interview series in the mid mm. funnel where you're educating around how your solution solves uh, uh, the problems that they have or even that sort of thought leadership. Yes. You've got to design the programs, those blocks, right? But looking at the single webinar itself, just a, a once-off event, 
you can find opportunities to surround those prospects and your customers with other pieces of content. Mm -hmm. So uh, you'll probably pick up on some some uh, secret sauce here today in, in, in the console, but we'll provide lots of different content that allows you to um, binge while you're watching this yeah. episode, right? And you're surrounding them the, with, with content experiences that are related to the webinar. Uh, and that's a great way to just really accelerate the education process. Yeah. You know, if you think about was it the Forrester research that was published a few years back uh, and how many touch points you need to move somebody from, yeah. from uh, lead to revenue, yeah. uh, think about how many touch points you can get in a single webinar, right, and the signals that that can generate. I also like thinking about, you know, uh, probably some of the least uh, used or uh, the use cases around webinars being around the sort of mid-funnel, right? And I always love to see these these webinars are focused on the customer. There's mm. nothing more powerful than the customer's voice, right? And uh, I think it, many times you've been our customer for mm. uh, uh, for some of our spotlight yep. series, right? And uh, it, it's a, it's just a great way to to hear it from others on how they're working with your technology, yeah. your solution to, yep. to solve that problem. But uh, the other format that is rising in popularity, I'm sure you see this a lot as well, is this conversational format, yes. where you're yep. literally getting a couple of uh, speakers together yep. and you're putting it and you're posing it as an ask an expert panel. Uh, mm. And these formats are highly engaging because they're mostly. Uh, audience driven, yeah. right? All the questions uh, are coming from the audience. This isn't a scripted or a structured presentation yeah. with slides. Yeah. This is about just answering the people's questions. Yeah. And it's it's a very popular format that's 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 growing over the last twelve months. And then and then looking at uh, you know in terms of pipeline acceleration, you might have a different approach in terms of you know how you're following up with some of the leads mm -hmm. behind your webinar program. Uh, would you necessarily send this, your sales team out in at full force behind yeah. your top of the funnel series? No. Yeah. You've, you've got to adapt based on the signals you receive and what the program is intended to do. So uh, for us, as an example, we have a, a demo program, yep. which has been designed as a bottom of the funnel webinar program. Mm. And the, the reason, uh, the objective behind that is to relieve the pressure that it takes for the salespeople to go out and demonstrate the product. Each of those sessions could take up to an hour, yeah. but with a, a webinar that's scalable and repeatable, we can run that on repeat daily uh, yeah. as a half an hour block. Yeah. And that takes a lot of pressure off the sales team. Um, and the point here is that the, their follow-up methodology and the process they go through for those type of people that are more educated in the process mm. would be very different to the people that, you know, say if we ran a, a webinar program that's based at the top of the funnel. Yeah. So align with your sales team on how to follow up and, and that will uh, make sure that uh, you're, you, outwards it shows that you're communicating with your internal teams. Mm. Excellent. So, so, yeah, okay, yeah. the next section, right? We're, we're looking at, uh, uh, you know, the, the value of on-demand and mm. pre-recording. Yep. And this was a really interesting uh, section for me because, uh, you know, like you, we come up with our own benchmark yeah. report. And one of the insights that, that uh, we saw this year from our On24 benchmark yep. report was that the appetite for on-demand content is climbing. Right. It is, and it goes back to this whole Netflix style of events. And um, I, we've actually found that. Um, so the last year when we did this, we actually saw thirty-five percent average attendance rate on mm. events. We've seen. I don't know if you have, but over the past few months, that's been increasing. Yeah. But you've still got over half of those people actually choosing to watch your content on demand as mm. well. So having this on-demand strategy, as opposed to saying, "Okay, my webinar's done and dusted. Let's host it online," mm. is incredibly important. So as you can see here, uh, seventy-five percent of people are doing the majority of their webinars live. So most of us want that live engagement. They mm. want to actually have something and they want this Q&A and they want to, similar to like you said, with panel discussions and stuff like that as well. There has actually been a 16% increase in Simulive though. And I think there's a few reasons for this. I think the ability to reach out and get presenters when you want them, as opposed to giving them a certain time and date, mm -hmm. is definitely going to be an advantage for you. But also, your time poor as presenters as well. And if the majority of your audience isn't going to watch live, mm -hmm. then you sort of need to work around that because webinars are hard. Mm. And as we'll go into it, we'll talk about the resource challenges, which is something completely different. But one of the things um, we also found was a huge amount of people are hosting their webinars on demand, which wasn't necessarily the case last year. So I think now we're understanding that because we're looking at our data, we're looking at what's actually happening with our attendance, and there's this switch that we're flicking and saying, well, do you know what? Let's do a bit of a hybrid approach as well. Um, one thing I will um, say is we have the perfect opportunity right now to start mixing things up a bit and doing things a little bit differently, when it, especially when it comes to live and on demand. So I'll give you two examples. So we um, 
probably around well, virtual conferences are huge now, right? Mm. But if you had a live virtual conference that ran for two days, would you seat? Would you sit behind a computer for two days straight watching live content? No. Well, no, I know. Well, you have trouble with, on an hour call with me. I know that you're getting distracted, Tim. So there definitely needs to be, think like an attendee and start to think about how you can work with the different collaboration tools you have and the different um, even features in the platform to mm. make it happen. So mm. we had someone come to us, OK, this was start of COVID-19 when everything started to go a bit crazy. We're all in reaction mode. Two-day annual conference, what do we do? Get presenters into the studio to record three pieces of pre-recorded content that people can ac actually watch. Mm -hmm. But then we also had live. So 9am in the morning, attendees logged on for four hours of live sessions that went back to back. First one was a pre-recorded video of the CEO. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today. We've had to pivot. Second time I've said that. We've had <laughs> to pivot uh, to this style of event. We're now going to introduce some speakers that will be talking. As soon as that event ended, they then shifted everyone to a website that was built and tailored for this digital conference and people could watch that for an entire week and continue to earn professional development points. Great. So not only then is your content, which was two days, mm -hmm. going to live on for an entire week yeah. and possibly even more than you want it to, you're then saying to your attendees, do you know what, we understand you're busy and things are crazy at the moment, so we're going to give you a week to digest this content. Yeah. So definitely think about using a blended approach and I think we'll see a lot more of this as we do the report next year. Yeah, great advice. Yeah. The other part is around where your webinars live um, and I think this has always been something that we try and try to advise um, our customer base because you want to keep generating that traction after your event is over. So as you can see, um, over half of the people here are saying we just put it on the website, we put it on YouTube, we put it on the website and people want, want to watch it. That's great for awareness, but if the majority of us are running webinars for lead generation, which is what we saw earlier, we need to think about how we're constantly tracking these attendees and how we're actually monitoring who's joining live and who's joining on demand as well. So one of the things we recommend is using a branded video on demand platform, which um, a lot of people are by the sounds of things, which yeah. is great. Um, but then after that three months, you probably gained a lot of that traction by then. So then maybe hosting your video on YouTube um, or Vimeo so you can actually get that SEO from it and mm. people can actually come across your video and then embed it on your website. But that sort of month, sometimes, sometimes it's only a month, two to three months, by then a lot of the content you probably have to revisit mm. as well because a lot of it's probably not evergreen. Yeah. So really start to think about where you're hosting it, how long for, and just don't forget about it as well. So a few other options on there, but definitely think about your on-demand strategy because sometimes it needs to be completed separate from your webinar lead gen strategy. So just some pro tips for uh, webinars and on demand. So first of all, having this always on content strategy is a must. And finding ways to integrate some of these on demand webinars into your websites and your other programs is also essential. And one of the things, um, when you alluded to Ask the Experts, I love that idea because yeah. I think panel discussions are so much more engaging. We actually had um, Australian Marketing Institute um, a few weeks back, so they had training they had to deliver to people internationally. So what they did is they got a range of experts to come into the studio and create 30-minute videos, which were pieced to camera with slides. Mm -hmm. They were recorded... And then following that, at different times of the day, especially that was convenient for the people overseas, mm. we hopped online, we had everyone join via a video conference, we streamed that 30-minute presentation, and then we opened up everyone's video conference line, and then the presenter sat there for Q&A. So mm. it started to... It was a lot easier on presenters. Yes. It was a whole heap easier on the organisation. Yes. But it also gave... It was a perfect example of how you can use different platforms yes. to mix a blend of pre-recorded and on-demand. I agree. It's so I, clever. I think, I think you know, many, many businesses think that, you know, a webinar is simply just a replacement for a physical event, right? No. And, and, you know, when you're taking your events virtual, you've yes. got to include that networking capability and yep. that sort of two-way interaction uh, within yeah. that experience, right? Yep. So that's a that's a really great example yeah. of, of how companies are doing that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's 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 important to, to identify that from the outset. Do you want this to be an interactive networking um, yeah. sort of event? Yep. And make sure you bolt on that capability. Well, interaction and engagement isn't just 
the features on the platform anymore. Yeah. And a few years back it was. And I mm. saw this uh, great blog by um, Mark Jones from Filtered Media, which I was talking to yes. you about before, and his idea of the evolution of the webinar. So starting off from the talking head on a webcam, you know, Go to meeting sort of style where mm. people would log in, their yeah. cats were in the background, the webcams were freezing. Then we evolved to the streaming side of things, yep. which still hasn't taken off as much as it probably should have. But now we're in this this time of where we're talking about TV shows and mm. episodes yes. and getting people engaged and bringing that human element into it. Yes. It doesn't need to be polished anymore where you've got someone sitting there with their corporate banner behind them doing four different takes. Exactly. Because people want that human element to yes. come through it. It's so more authentic. I think, I, authenticity. I don't know if you're enjoying Word it as well. Of this but session. The, <laughs> all the All the Zoom calls and Teams calls oh. where you just get a, a look inside the life yes. of, of the, the person behind the bio. Yes. And uh, it's, it's something that you can't replace that. No, that you, can't. Um, you know, I think marketers do have a habit of, you know, over overproducing things yeah. and this sort of scrappy mentality of just throwing together, get some great content pieces yeah. in, and provide an interactive um, yeah. a session yeah. is is the way forward. Don't insult your audience. Try and keep it authentic. Um, so let's talk about resources now because it's all well and good to have the platforms available to you, but webinars can be hard, mm. and it's not so much. I think it's just more that we understand what's involved because we don't want to sugarcoat anything and say running these webinar programs, which are hugely successful, in your case, up to 40 a month, they're not necessarily hard, but you need to create a playbook and see what works for your organisation. We're working with um, an organisation we work with, they've been running webinars for 10 years, evolved massively. Mm. They've got a whole team of five people who now run their webinars. Wow. So let's just go through and get your thoughts that came through the report. So first of all, we want to ask the question, are webinars easy to produce? And as you can see, the majority of people are indifferent, um, probably because it's one of those things that's like, oh, I've never really thought about it, to be honest. Uh, but 26% of people say they're not actually that easy to produce. And I think we all feel the pinch and the stress and the nerves, especially with a live event, when you're doing the five, four, three, two, one countdown when it <laughs> takes off, there's always that, oh God, what's going yep. to go wrong? Because it's technology, right? and that's what it is. But technology is only one component of what we're talking about here. So we're talking about the marketing assets, getting people to register, getting your different stakeholders involved, training your presenters, which yeah. is huge. And two out of three people manage this in-house. So half the people indicate they don't have the resources to actually make this work. Mm. And it usually takes around two to four people to manage a webinar program to get that up and running. So we did some research internally as well. As a managed webinar provider, it's important that we know exactly how long webinars take. Mm. 11 and a half hours from concept to completion. There you go. So that's a new webinar. Mm. So obviously there's a lot more involved in terms of debriefs and pre-production calls and making yeah. sure everything's set. But just understand to do this properly, work needs to go involved, work needs to be involved and you do need to dedicate time to that. Yeah. And you need to use internal resources. And I think you've probably, you'll find efficiencies along the way, right? Yeah. The, to your point, the first oh, time absolutely. you run a webinar is always going to be a, a slower, more thorough process, but you develop yeah. a playbook to get yeah. it off the ground quicker. Yeah, exactly. So think about the format that you're using as well, and we've spoken about this a little bit now. So understanding that it's not always about video being king, and we know that a lot of people like the video component of it as well, mm. but it does remove a lot of the complexity if you don't have video. And one thing we've realised, um, especially since everything's hit us over the past few months, is that Australia's internet isn't that great. Not sure yeah. if anyone's noticed. Um, <laughs> they don't really think we'll set up for this. But a lot of people are, the presenter briefing side of things, especially with remote webinars now, is such a big component. Mm -hmm. So not only are you briefing them on how to use the platform, but testing their internet at 10 a.m. in the morning on a Wednesday compared to 6 p.m. at night very good on point. that Wednesday, yeah. may be completely different. So you need to be prepared to maybe not have video the entire time and maybe have a headshot of the presenter up there. Because if there's one thing I can guarantee, and I'm sure we've all been there, the audio quality of your event is paramount. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can live with someone's headshot being up and it's almost 
quite engaging because sometimes you think of it as a bit, bit of a podcast with some interaction. Yes. But I cannot live with crappy internet, so don't sacrifice it. It's a good point. Uh, we come across this challenge uh, across Asia as yeah. well, yeah. Uh, where you know bandwidth can be limited, and you know sometimes you have to think about that format very yeah. carefully based on where your core audience will be. Yeah. Um, Australia, we haven't found too many issues, but uh, certainly as we span deeper yeah. into Asia, we, we do come across some yeah. of those challenges. Yep. Yeah. And not having to worry about this will relieve a lot of it. So if you're managing this all in-house, mm. these are some tips to make sure it goes off without a hitch. Um, the other thing is around the slideless webinar as well, or another format which people just love doing and I can't stand doing it is screen sharing on a webinar. <laughs> so I just find screen sharing is much more for a collaborative style event. Yes. Um, and screen sharing also takes up bandwidth yeah, as yep. well. So that's going to impact your video and possibly your camera. Yes. So really think about the format. Try and consider a panel discussion without slides because sometimes you don't need the slides, especially if you've got ask a question. Yeah, I, I agree. It's it's moving to this notion of uh, conversations are greater yes. than presentations. Yeah. And you don't necessarily need slides to, to guide uh, the conversation or no. guide the story, the narrative, right? Yeah, exactly. And I also think if you've got... Um, Anything that you need to screen share, maybe the webinar, which is sort of a one-way distribution um, mm. channel, mm -hmm. isn't the best solution mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should be looking into more like web conferencing or something like that. But once again, it depends on everyone. Um, and then think about using um, people to help outsource the event. So whether it's managed providers, whether it's getting people into a studio to remove the technology burden, or definitely having presenters and moderators. Um, I think any, especially with these virtual conferences, I don't know how people run them yeah. with no facilitator or moderator yeah. um, and if you've got a panel if there was more one more of us we definitely need a presenter or moderator here just to keep timings keep things on track keep us on uh, track a nice top and tail to the yep. session yep absolutely so we've sort of segued into this but just quickly i'll go into engagement and interactivity because i did say I do believe that engagement and interactivity is very different than having a few features activated. Mm. Um, presenters, and we've said this for years, your benchmark reports <laughs> indicate it, yep. my benchmark reports, everything could be brilliant on your event, but if you do not have enthusiastic and engaging presenters, people will drop off. Yeah. Um, content has actually increased. I'm tending seen a lot more people actually saying content is also very yeah, important course. and there's nothing worse than joining a webinar and it not being what you signed up for. Yeah. You have that one shot. Yeah. Look, I, I think I said this last year yeah. even, but the principles reign true. It's it's really this, there's three legs to the tripod here. Yeah. You've got your presenters, yep. you've got your content yep. and number one, you've, you, most most markets actually neglect the experience, yeah. right? Yep. So this, this branded uh, console, this mm. environment that you can welcome people in as part of your branded experience, but also thinking about uh, how you're, you know, weaving interactivity throughout the whole thing. Yes. Uh, you, you'll get to this stat in a minute, but... You know, so many people think that uh, running a successful interactive webinar is simply just by bolting 10 minutes of Q&A on the end. Yeah, it's or not. polls it's not. that mean nothing. It's, you have to find those moments of interactivity mm. throughout the whole experience. And I think to your point, Keith, so we've got 62% of people say they build webinars with interactivity in mind. Mm -hmm. And we've also got 53% of people saying that they have usually around four people on a webinar, which has mm. definitely increased since last year. Yeah. Is that 62% making sure that they get those presenters involved in that briefing session to build that interactivity and yeah. to make sure it's relevant? So, like you said, your presenters, your attendees and your customers, you need to look at these three people and talk about the experience. Mm. Um, one customer who's doing a series of webinars a week, and it's to rural and remote organisations, they've started to build this up slowly, and I love it. Okay. And this community that they're building is just so with them along this journey. Great. And it's actually really nice to see. So they started with the, how far they've come has been amazing. They started with Q&A. Mm -hmm. Then the next webinar, they opened the chat so people can start chatting amongst each other. Mm -hmm. And then they launched polling last week and everyone was like, oh, wow, this is great. We're yeah. polling. Next week, what they're doing, they're getting people to submit video questions and oh, they're great. playing it through the platform. Oh, that's awesome. So it's like Tony Jones on Q&A. It wasn't <laughs> Tony Jones anymore, is it? Yeah. Um, but building people up because as an attendee, there's a lot to do yeah. on a webinar. You're listening, you're watching, you're learning, you've probably got kids in the background. And so polling, chat private chat, open chat, there's a mm. lot to do in there. So yeah. think about maybe gradually working people up when it comes to a new series. There's a lot you can do and you don't need to overcook it, but you've got to find those uh, those 
features or that functionality yes. is part of the experience that, that gets people hooked and, and engaged with you. Yeah, and relevance is definitely key. So think about your favourite talk show, think about what you want to recreate um, and then maybe not use slides and maybe think about engagement on another level. Engagement doesn't necessarily have to be features and functionality. Multiple presenters, as we saw, a lot of people are actually starting to use these, and these drive more interactive conversations with people. Um, we're launching another TV show um, in, which is aimed at the investor relations community in a few weeks' time, and there's two companies that are branded on it, and we're going to uh, be the facilitator on the panel, and we're mm. going to alternate. Yeah. So think about how you can utilise that, and you, you've probably got talent sitting in your office right now yeah. that you haven't even thought about. Yeah. And weave that interactivity throughout the experience. Think about about when you want to use polls and if you do want to use polls make sure you insert that on a something so tactical but insert on a slide poll with the question so you're prompted because once your presenters are in there there's so much going through their head it's mm. easy to sort of just skip through that and yeah. then go to the end and go oh wait we didn't launch that poll and now it's no longer relevant yeah I th that's a really good point i mean i think presenters have so much on their plate just to deliver the content yes. and provide a conversation right <clears throat> i think the 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 key takeaway here is think about the audience member and the the presenter Owns more more responsibility on this execution yeah. than ever. Yep. They have to provide that that uh, those moments of interactivity along the way. But as well. A lot of the time, they're not involved, yeah. or they're just sort of okay. What's your topic? Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. There's a whole briefing session that needs yeah. to go on. So there's our tips for interactivity and engagement. So so many options, and we don't want to overwhelm you. We just want to provide you with the facts to make sure you can make better decisions. Um, but how do we get people to turn up? So we've spoken around attendance yeah. rates before and getting people engaged. What did we find out this year around um, promotion and conversion and integration? Yeah, look, we, we regularly survey our audiences at On24 with every webinar and, and we might have, you know, thousands of attendees on, on these webinars. But the number one challenge that most people have with their webinar program is actually building an audience. Uh, you know, how do I get more registrations? Mm. So this section really looks at, uh, you know, of course there's, there's multiple aspects to this section, but the one that uh, I thought would be most interesting for the audience today is, um, you know, the, where, where are our actual um, registrations coming from and what's, what's proven to be the most mm. effective promotional channel? And this wasn't uh, particularly surprising uh, to see that that email invitation comes out on top. I think that's kind of no-brainer. Mm. It's the, the channel of choice for most webinar producers. Um, seeing it at 33%, uh, I have seen that number higher in, in other studies we've mm. done, uh, even up to 60 to 80% yeah. uh, being a core cool driver. So it's important that we get this right, and uh, I'll finish with some tips on this slide. But the other thing I want to call out here is that uh, it's so great to see so many, in fact, 18% uh, leveraging uh, their sales team, their sales comrades to, wow, to, to get involved. Getting involved. Uh, this certainly wasn't the story last year and, no. and one of the recommendations, but... Uh, you know, seeing that uh, marketers are now working more collaborative with their sales counterparts to help spread the word of their content and, and help solve the problems of, of customers that uh, customers and prospects they're engaged with is, is great to see. I think the website, uh, you know, again, kind of a no-brainer, and we're starting to see marketers think more strategically around, um, you know, how they find content, they're doing keyword analysis mm -hmm. and looking at, um, you know, the SEO performance as to, you know, what topics they could potentially craft, and then they're leveraging those keywords in titles and throughout the description yeah. to really draw in that organic traffic to the webinar program. So I think that's a tried and tested strategy there. Uh, email's no-brainer, but uh, great to see that we're, you know, uh, uh, calling to arms all of our uh, comrades across uh, sales but also customer-facing teams. So when it comes to tips, a lot of these are focused around the email channel because given that they do drive uh, the, the sheer volume of registrations for us, um, perhaps one of the, the biggest tips and advice that I can offer is that uh, we see so many marketers just, uh, and, and it's probably a no-brainer, when you look at the resources that we have, mm. most of it, half the audience is saying we don't have the resources. So yeah. spending cycles on developing content and promoting your webinar in different ways uh, often falls down the, the uh, priority order. So we see a lot of marketers will just produce one email and send that out three or four times, right? That's it's lazy marketing, yep. and uh, we, we've probably all been slapped on risk for doing that from time to time. But uh, essentially, we need to find ways, different angles to promote these mm -hmm. so that we learn what resonates best with the audience, whether that's the speaker's expertise, the uh, solutions that you bring to the table, the unique perspective that your webinar is going to offer. Uh, find ways to uh, promote your webinar differently. Mm. 
I'd also say that uh, mixing up your email formats has been a key to success for, for driving registrations mm -hmm. for us. And what I mean by that is, you know, typically we think about our email uh, promotion and it's usually a glossy, mm. uh, overproduced HTML email that looks nice. And from a marketing standpoint, we, we give the stamp of approval mm -hmm. and it looks great and it's going to do the job. But often they're ineffective. Mm. Uh, sometimes, you know, competing in the inbox can be challenging. Uh, so we've, we've had a lot of success with uh, the simple, understated, plain text email. Mm. Uh, the plain text email that comes across very personalised, there's no glossy marketing elements to it. Yes, it's written by a marketer, but often we, m we make it presented or, or produced by the actual speaker themselves. Yeah. Uh, so it's a personal note from the speaker to the audience to invite them to attend. And we use lots of words like we and I'll show you this and this is what you'll take from, from my presentation. We also see the addition of having just one singular slide being promoted as part mm -hmm. of that. So it's like, this is what I'm going to share. You want more? I'm going to tease yeah. you in to, to, to get the full value. So if, if today I was to promote this email, we might share one of these key stats mm. um, to show, oh, yeah. this is the type of content that I'll get from attending. We spoke about this a little bit, but the power, if we can only drop three or four emails in a given promotional cycle, mm. and we always recommend between you know, three to four weeks out you start promoting the event, you know, you're limited. We can't spam the world and, no, and start right. sending emails every single day. But this, this idea of turning everyone in your organisation into a marketer, providing them with copy or bullet points that they can take and leverage, either share on social or share in their own um, you know, sales dialogues that they have, uh, is, is a fantastic way to tap into the mass, right? Yeah. Uh, one, one recent example, we took over all of our sales reps' signatures mm. and it was almost like a personal violation. It was like I set up shop in yeah. their house and uh, I, I camped out in yeah. their house. It was a, it, they felt very violated from doing that. But in fact, it, it, every, every time they sent out an email, it promoted our webinar series yeah. and allowed us to capitalise on that email traffic as well. And then perhaps the last and, and maybe the most valuable uh, tip here is, is this idea of cross-webinar pollination, mm. okay? So this idea of leveraging the existing engagement in the webinar that you have today and promoting the next one. It requires a little bit of organisation, but if you start thinking longer term and serialising your webinar content, it's, it's easily achievable, yeah. right? So, uh, you know, if I was to ask you all to join the next webinar that we have available uh, in the resource section, mm. this is what I mean. Yep. We constantly see between 10 and 15% of, of our webinar audience migrating to the next session. The yep. uh, so before we even push a singular slide, we'll ask the moderator or the presenter to propone the next session. Yep. And it's proven to be an effective tactic. So webinars are great. Yes. Uh, they're great at driving engagement. But the the reason that we drive, we rerun webinars is because we're interested in the data. Mm. What does the data tell us about our audiences and how can we use that data to profile? So we asked, what do marketers do with, with webinar data? Yep. Does it just sit there in the system? Sometimes, you yeah. can see. But uh, this, was a, this was a nice increase year on year where we started to see more marketers realising the value of integrating their, their webinar platforms with the tools that they use every day. Their CRMs, their marketing automation platforms, right? And when you start thinking about this logically, you think, okay, we're using this for lead generation mm. as the number one use case. Well, it makes, makes sense to use get this actionable data mm. and put it in the hands where our sales team is. I love the fact that that's at 53%, almost 54 because last year it wasn't yeah. that high. And I remember us having a discussion around this and just saying, what are you guys doing? Why are you doing this if mm. not to share with your sales team? So I think it's great that people are starting to manage Start with the end in mind, which I think yeah. we spoke about before. So making sure that you know this data is going somewhere, but then how is that converting? Yeah, think about how the recipients of that data will use it. Yeah. Uh, so it makes sense if you if you have a, a customer relationship platform, yep. and over time you're building a profile of your lead, your customer. Think about how much intel and how much richer those customer profiles can be yeah. if you integrate your webinar activity right through to, to those platforms. And the same applies for marketing. Mm. Some marketers are getting extremely uh, uh, sophisticated in their approach of yeah. using engagement data to, to capitalise on the behaviours that happen during that mm. one hour or 30 minute session and using those signals to drive spe specific action. And we'll have a look at that in a second. So what do you do with your engagement data? Well, it's sharing leads with sales. I think that's a no-brainer and, and dovetails nicely into what we've just been explaining. Many are using it to uh, also assess their program performance and, and evaluate the content effectiveness. I think that's also a good, good use of the data to uh, work out whether you continue along the same vein um, as you're producing content or you pivot directions altogether. That's one for me. There you go.
So, uh, looking looking at uh, you know how do we optimize uh, you know the data flows and the use of data. Uh, we always advise that you know when you're designing these experiences, yes, you want to have multiple content pieces as part of that journey, right? But also think strategically about how you're designing these these uh, these webinars as well. Uh, think about you know what sort of signals you can get by including different types of content. So an example could be uh, maybe you have some case study materials in there. Maybe you have a, a link to your upcoming demo, mm. or maybe it's uh, some pricing information, uh, membership information, yeah. whatever it might be. Every click and interaction as part of that webinar can be taken as a signal. Yeah. And the more marketers start to think strategically about their execution of a single event, but also a series, the more they'll realise the value that a webinar can bring in terms of those uh, subtle signals that you can, you can, you can uh, use as part of your follow-up. We touched on this as well, but uh, the, the real value is uh, not behind just collecting a name behind your mm. webinar program, right? Mm. It's not just about, ah, oh, success. I've got, yeah. I've got Sarah as part of my database now. That's, that's not what we're interested in and what we should be focused on. We're, we should be focused on the, the behavioural and the engagement data that we can get from having experience with you. Mm. So all the questions that you ask, the, the, the way that you respond to polls, another format that you can think strategically about, the polls, right? Yeah. The type of questions you ask to, to understand uh, and develop richer profiles. Uh, the surveys, mm. the, the uh, additional content that you make available during these webinars is, is key to building out profile and understanding where that prospect or that person sits as part of the sales journey. Uh, so, you know, lots of things that you can do with it mm. and I'm glad to see that, you know, the first step is integrating, getting the data where you need it so yeah. you can increase your uh, marketing sophistication around what you do with that. Uh, but, you know, a, a key takeaway here is that, you know, We've got this data, we know who attends and who doesn't. We should be using a lot of that data to inform our lead scoring as well. And yep. many of us have uh, you know, robust lead scoring programs. It's now 2020 and we've, we've all sort of finessed this uh, to a place that mm -hmm. we're, we're content with how we're scoring our leads. But once one, one piece that I consistently see that marketers neglect is this idea of scoring webinar leads the same way. Mm -hmm. Marketers have a ton of data as we just discussed. And why can't we start to look at engagement data yep. to inform higher level of scoring or a lower level of scoring, just because everyone's attended this webinar, we shouldn't score them the same way. Yep. And then wrapping, wrapping this and having a look at, uh, you know, how marketers are deeming webinars to be success mm -hmm. or a failure. Uh, this, this was a very interesting uh, part of the report, which uh, unfortunately wasn't the results that I was hoping for. Never is. <laughs> when it comes yeah. to um, measuring success, I feel people, attendees are still just the number one measure of success. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's easy and it's vanity, but it needs to be measured, but we need to we need to go deeper. Yeah. So, you know, looking at uh, you know how marketers are, are deeming a webinar to be successful, uh, a lot of putting emphasis on those attendees and and registrations are closely followed by that. And really, <clears throat> this is disappointing to me because, you know, I, I view this as the equivalent of a of a click uh, or a form capture. You know, there's not a lot of value in that. And you know, if I was to take uh, registration or attendee numbers through to uh, the, the leadership table, uh, I think I'd yeah. get a lot of blank looks. Uh, really, the, the advice here is to start looking at, um, you know, what is, your, what is your end objective? And if it is lead generation, demand generation, yeah. you know, how do you start to measure that? Is it, is it campaign influence the pipeline? Is it, a, is it revenue attribution behind that? Is it, is it a cost savings initiative? Or is it simply how many people you've educated and certified? How do you actually measure that? So, um, you know, it's not to say that uh, people aren't thinking this way, but it's uh, the, the overwhelming majority is sort of focused on those lower, lower value metrics uh, to determine success. And I'm not saying we shouldn't look at these. They are still indicators and, mm. uh, uh, you know, ways that we get a feel whether something is working, but they shouldn't be the measure of success in my mind. Yep. At the end of the day, I don't care if I get 100 people or 500 people to the webinar, if they're the right people and yep. they're helping move the business forward, that's, that's the result that you want, right? Yep. So um, the, the tips behind measuring success is, you know, don't, don't fall short and start thinking about the attendee goals and registration. You should have those goals, but they should be uh, a secondary focus. Uh, start with the end in mind, to, to Sarah's point. You know, where, what do you want to be celebrating success down the line and how do you prove the value of the webinar program? If you can tie that to a revenue number, a pipeline generation or a cost savings initiative, it's going to be far more receptive when you're presenting uh, the performance of your program internally. Um, 
and also align with your business to, to determine what that success is. Sometimes marketing can be disconnected from the business, right? Mm. And, and uh, often that's probably why we celebrate these small wins, these likes and tweets and mm. clicks and uh, open rates that, you know, nobody really should care about. They're just <laughs> indicators, right? So work out what the business cares about, align to those and, and uh, you know, develop a structure and a framework to me measure your webinar success against that. So with that, yes. I think, look, that was a 30-page report uh, yes. condensed and summarised. And, uh, Exhausting. <laughs> I, you know, I think, I think a nice way to end this, uh, particularly in, in a, uh, you know, the, the, um, the state of, of mm. environment, the, the COVID world that we found ourselves yep. in now, um, just to share some, some parting advice as to, you know, yeah. how our markets can and do this I think, better. Um, like you said, uh, this, my advice now would be a lot different to what it would be six months ago, but mm. definitely it's very, very easy to get tempted to be reactive in this sort of environment and to just go out because everyone's doing it. And people are saturated with content, but if you deliver it properly and if you sit down and you actually work on your strategy, trust me, this bit of time that you're doing at the beginning will save you so much more in the long run mm -hmm. and will definitely inflate your return on investment. So you need to, my biggest advice would be make sure that you plan for this success and always start with the end in mind, but also make sure you're not just trying to do everything all at once. Don't necessarily use all the features. Don't necessarily try and just get all presenters in, into one room and try and do 10 people at once. Really sit down and plan your content, create some consistency and do what works for you because we can't all be the same and we're going to have so much saturation if we try. Even we're seeing bottlenecks now of people running webinars between 11 and 2. So I like to run my webinars in the afternoon because people yeah. are more chilled yeah. and with people working from home, our habits are changing. So start to think about the external environment because you don't just want to be bundled in with everyone else's events. Yeah, that's good. That's good advice. And I think what I'd, what I'd add to that is, you know, particularly during this state of, of, of play where, you know, you know people are working from home and, uh, you know, do have a lot of time on the hands. We're also seeing a, a huge volumes of, of registrational invitations in our mm. inbox every day, right? You, you're probably the same. Yeah. I get, uh, you know, at least 10 to 20 every morning before I wake up from, from different parts of the world. Uh, <clears throat> now more than ever, we have to find a way to stand out. Yes. And I think the ones that are being innovative, pushing the boundaries and, and not overcooking things like you stated, but finding ways to be different and offer an experience that, you know, the audience can connect with and they'll appreciate that because they'll come back over and over again, yep. even post this crisis. I think... You know, one of the one of the things that uh, you know COVID has, has taught us is that you know businesses now need to be digital first thinking, right? Uh, you know, the the businesses that haven't had to change and throughout the whole marketing plan for the year are still marching on because they've had a digital first strategy. Mm. And webinars are, are key to success in in many cases. So, yeah. uh, think about you know whether the, you're new to this journey or if it's uh, your, your matured uh, webinar marketer, mm -hmm. uh, think about putting your digital program first so that you have to scramble when, when the next COVID wave hits us. Okay. So, so that, that brings Thanks us to an end. Thanks. And yeah, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. We want to encourage everyone to uh, download the report. It's available as part of this experience today. And uh, until next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. You.